We light the first candle to honor Christianity. God is able to make all grace abound to you, so that having all sufficiency in all things at all times, you may abound in every good work. We light the second candle to honor Judaism. May Adonai bless you and keep you. May Adonai deal kindly and graciously with you. May Adonai bestow favor upon you and grant you peace. We light the third candle to honor Buddhism. What ultimately matters is how we view the things we have. Do we use our wealth to build up our egos and feed into our sense of entitlement? Or do we share its benefits and the positive advances it can bring? We light the fourth candle to honor Taoism. If you understand others, you are smart. If you understand yourself, you are illuminated. If you overcome others, you are powerful. If you overcome yourself, you have strength. If you know how to be satisfied, you are rich. We light the fifth candle to honor Hinduism. If you approach the ocean with a cup, you can only take away a cup. If you approach it with a bucket, you can take away a bucket full. We light the sixth candle to honor Sikhism. The three keys to success and, and the spirit are know who you are, allow everything to come to you, share it with others. And we light the final candle to honor Lakota spirituality. <clears throat> Whatever you do in life, do the very best you can with both your heart and mind. If you do it that way, the power of the universe will come to your assistance. If you truly join your heart and mind as one, then whatever you ask for, that's the way it's going to be. <clears throat> this morning's reading is from Lynn Twist. So much of our life around money is centered in scarcity's problem-based assumptions and the spiraling diagnosis and chase for solutions beyond our grasp. If instead you can put your full attention and appreciation on what's there, then you experience the bounty available in each moment. You experience sufficiency, and that's what you're about. So we take a few moments together, please, and contemplate today's reading. <coughs> So here now in this sacred space, this holy ground, I know that God is all that there is, that around us and within each of us is but the one, and that this time together is a time of love, a time of joy, it is a time of bounty and gratitude, appreciation attention on ourselves and our growth and our expansion and attention on one another and our love for one another. I know that we are blessed and I know that we are a blessing in our greater community. And so I simply say thank you. Thank you to the one. Thank you to spirit. Thank you to God for this moment, this time, and all that transpires. And so it is. And so it is. So before I begin with today's topic, this past Wednesday was the 2019 Transgender Day of Remem Remembrance, and we stop and observe it every year. It's a day to pause and reflect on those who lost their lives simply because they didn't fit somebody else's mold of how things should be. In the U.S. last year, there were 29, 28 of whom were women, 25 of whom were women of color. Alarming. And they were killed simply because they didn't fit someone else's stereotype and there were about 337 around the world. So what I want to do is simply read the names of those in the U.S. and let us take a moment and give thanks for their lives and their courage and their authenticity and to pray for peace and love. Tidy Dansbury, Kiana Mattel, Dana Martin, Ellie Marie Washtuck, Jazeline Ware, Ashanti Carmen, Claire Legato, Leline Kubelet Polanco Extravaganza, Zoe Spears, Brooklyn Lindsay, 
Denali Barry Stuckey, Tracy Singo, Bubba Walker, Marquis Kiki Fantroy, and Jordan Kofer. And it is my prayer today that each one of us lets the love that is in our hearts simply move out from us into the world, lighting our own lives and those of the lives around us, helping people to understand and see through love instead of fear and bias and prejudice and hate, helping others to understand that it is the expression of each individualized person, consciousness, spirit, that makes the world beautiful. So I give thanks for each of these people and their existence, their willingness to be all that they came here to be as they came here to be. And I know peace for them, for their families, for those who love them, and for each one of us. I give thanks, I let it go. And so it is. And so it is. It's always a painful remembrance because it, it seems like the this past year, the number increased. I don't know whether it did or not, but it's painful. And so today we're going to wind up our November discussion of our relationship with things financial. And I'm not, you know, we haven't been talking about money is because we ask you to contribute. We haven't been talking about money because we sent a pledge card and asked you to, to make a pledge for next year so we can plan our year. We haven't talked about, we're not talking about money because we want more of your money. We're talking about money because it's our relationship with money that's one of the most difficult in our lives. And we have the power to direct our thoughts and our consciousness in every area of our lives. You know, if we choose to focus on lack and scarcity and fear and resentment and jealousy and prejudice and hatred and not enoughness, then that's what we experience in life, right? It, but if we learn to direct our consciousness somewhere else, we will have a different experience of life. We're talking about money because we would all, I think, like to have a different experience of it. In our culture, it's a weird subject. It's a weird part of our lives. It, personally, I want all of us to have more freedom and ease about every area of our lives, including these difficult ones. Relationships, sex, money. <laughs> Those are the three big ones, aren't they? Identity is another one, you know? Ease and grace and space and freedom around everything is really what we're about. But in order to experience that, we first have to figure out what we're focusing on now and how it makes us feel. We don't have to dwell on it. We just have to notice it. How are we directing our consciousness? And how does it make us feel? You know, I started the month out with that mantra that we learned from our culture, which is, I'm not enough, you're not enough, it's not enough, there's never enough, <laughs> right? It's all about not enough, not enough, not enough, and we chant that mantra, and we talked about the necessity of choosing a new mantra, which is sort of like, I'm sufficient to meet anything that comes my way. I am sufficient. My resources are sufficient. My needs are met. You know, we change that mantra because once we change it, we start telling ourselves a different story and we start thinking of ourselves differently and we start to believe in our own inner resources. And our whole experience changes. Everything changes. It's true whether we're talking about money or physical health or our energy or our relationships, whatever. We have the sufficiency, the inner resources to meet what life throws at us. Obviously, we're all here, right? We're all sitting upright. We have walked through difficult things and found resources we didn't know we had. So, will we always have those thoughts that kind of spring out of nowhere that say, yeah, but here, you just, you, you're not going to be able to cut this, right? You're not going to be able to handle this. Yeah, we'll, all, we'll probably always have those. Because of the way our brains are built, and we have this little part of it in, you know, deep, primitive parts of our brain that is always on the lookout for what could go wrong. Oh my God, what's going to step on me today? Probably nothing, 
probably nothing, but our brain still looks for those things. So these thoughts will come up seemingly out of nowhere. But if we stop focusing on them, if we stop following them down into that spiraling pit of despair, they lose their power. Pretty soon they just fly away and they're gone. It's only when we think, think something over and over and ruminate on it and chew on it that it becomes our belief. And then it colors everything. And so a very, very powerful way to help us change the way we think about money is the practice of appreciation. When we train ourselves to appreciate our own capacity to sustain ourselves, our own capacity to, to sustain our families, our capacity to contribute to each other's well-being, our ability to show up and walk through an experience. We start to nourish our experience of what's already there, what we have at our disposal, always, no matter what the circumstances are. And, and the other thing is that when we start to appreciate it, you know, what we appreciate, appreciates. So what we appreciate will begin to grow in our lives and in our experience. When things get tough, if we can take a moment to appreciate we have, that we have the capacity to meet the circumstances. We may not believe it in, the sec, in that second, but we've done it over and over and over again. If we understand that we have the capacity to meet the circumstances and to grow through them, to learn from them, what we're doing is creating value where we couldn't see any value previously. And we grow as a result, as does our capacity to meet life. See, we have this, this inner stream of life that's always there. We just have to learn to focus on that instead of on these little facts that may be happening down here. In The Soul of Money, the book that today's reading comes from, Lynn Twist writes this. She says, appreciation is a powerful, pra powerful practice of creating new value in our deliberate attention to the value of what we already have. Because what we appreciate, appreciates. And she tells a wonderful story in that book about a group of people from Bangladesh. You know, in the, in the 70s, Bangladesh was named the second most, second poorest country in the world. And, and here's the thing about it. It's about the size of Iowa, and there are 150 million people there. It's very crowded. And in the 1900s, other more powerful nations came in and denuded Bangladesh. They took everything good. They stripped all the trees, teak grew there. It used to be a lush rainforest, but they stripped everything, mined everything, and left dusty hills that soon became tangled with poisonous brambles. And the, the, the down below, below the hills, flooded every year. So if you farmed down below, your crops got flooded. If you lived up in the hills, you couldn't go or grow anywhere, you had to be really careful because there were these poisonous brambles and the government owned that land anyway so you weren't supposed to do anything there and so because of all of that there, and this is not a bad thing there was a flood of aid from outside countries but the government was such that the people couldn't use that aid for anything they used it for subsistence and over time they got really resigned to living on subsistence, bare subsistence from foreign aid, and they were resigned to that. They had forgotten their own capacity. So Lynn Twist and her organization, uh, please understand, I'm not blaming them. I think most of us would do the same in the circumstances, but there's a different way to think about this, and they found it. Lynn Twist had an organization called um, The Hunger Project, and they worked with some microloan providers in Bangladesh. You know, microloans are small cash loans that are provided to groups of people to help them get started in a business or something like that. And the Hunger Project would conduct these day-long workshops and, and would vision with people 
about, their, about what they wanted their country and their area. What would be the ideal, this, this was a particular region, what, would this, what do you want this region to look like? What's your vision for thriving here? They would vision, and then they would entice commitment from the people who lived there to this vision, and then they would help them develop a plan of action to bring it forward. There was one young man from a particularly blighted area who came to one of these day-long workshops and his vision took off. He was lit on fire. And he went home and recruited his six best friends and told them about this vision he had and his commitment to his people and his area. And, and they set up this committee, these six people. And... Um, Together they came to a shared vision and a shared commitment. And then they invited their, the people around them in their, in their village to join in. And they had a, um, a meeting and 600 people showed up. And those 600 went to work. They came up with a plan and an idea and, the, and they looked at the resources they had at their fingertips. First thing they did was get permission to clear 17 acres of those poisonous brambles. And then they went to everybody in the area and asked each one for a tiny little bit of money for resources and equipment. And they bought that stuff. And they built a road and they cleared the land. And because the government saw what was doing, what they were doing, they gave them another 100 acres. And so they taught all kinds of people, young and old and male and female, to farm. And while they were clearing this land, they found a lake and a stream with fish in it. And so what they have at the end of that is a big farm, a stream full of fish, training and employment for hundreds and hundreds of people. So there are 18,000 people in this area, all of whom benefited, and an area that had been poverty-stricken and in despair and wasted became sufficient unto itself, right? The crime rate, by the way, dropped 70%. Seven people focused on their vision and on their unlimited inner resources. And they began to appreciate them. And then they began to see more and more outer resources making themselves accessible. They started to see that what they really needed had been there all along. It's a big story, but it illustrates a principle that applies to everyone's life. It works for each one of us. When we begin to see and appreciate what we are and what we already have within us, our inner resources, our outer resources, those resources appreciate. Instead of negation and criticism and hopelessness, we begin to see discovery and vision, and design, and action, and things change. It's an active, appreciation is an active thing. It's, it's a little bit different from gratitude. Oh, I read the other day a definition that said gratitude is what we feel when things are going the way we think they should go. <laughs> appreciation instead is, is an active way of seeing that we already have what we need to make things go the way they should go. And we appreciate those little tiny seeds. The difference is slight, but appreciation is more active and exploratory. And it's a very powerful practice if we combine the two. Because if you take a moment and think about what is going right, what you're grateful for, maybe it's your warm bed first thing in the morning, maybe it's that dog who helps keep you warm at night, in my case, two. Um, maybe it's, you know, all the love that was expressed to me through the, through the notes on the shoes and that are still hanging in my office. Whatever it is that makes you very feel really grateful and good. And take that feeling into yourself. That attitude into yourself. And notice what's there. Acknowledge that you have walked through many difficult times with courage and stamina. You've learned from them. If you didn't, if you hadn't done that, you wouldn't be here. Acknowledge that you're, you've gained wisdom from those difficult experiences. 
from the easy experiences too. Acknowledge the fact that you've brought yourself to this day and this moment in your life and keep exploring with willingness and open eyes. You might discover that you have a talent for art or a talent for singing or whatever it is. Acknowledge all those pieces of strength and courage and wisdom and goodness and kindness and love and joy and abundance and harmony and health and balance that you already have. Those are your inner resources. They're limitless. Appreciate them. Appreciate all that. It's what makes you, you. Right? Every one of us has difficulties in life. Every person. I don't know a single person who has not lost touch with who they really are from time to time. A single person who hasn't forgotten their own worth. I don't know anyone who hasn't touched despair, looked it in the eye at some point in their life. Every one of us does that, but also every one of us has a unique, big bunch of amazingness that is our inner resources. And when we appreciate that, it starts to grow. It appreciates. And so, you know, the Buddha had a great metaphor for this. He likened a human being to a garden and he said, in every garden there are two kinds of seeds. There are the seeds that grow nasty, noxious things, and there are the seeds that grow love and joy and freedom and peace. What grows depends on where we place our, our attention and our nurture. If we choose to invest our attention in the seeds of scarcity, which shows up like my neighbors, all of whom can't park in their garages because they're stuffed with stuff that they never use, by the way. That's the thing about it, it's in the garage, right? You can't hardly use it because you have to clear up the whole garage to even find it. Accumulation, greed, feelings of not enough. What drives all that stuff? I'm not enough, so I'm gonna stuff my garage with stuff it will make me feel better. It doesn't work. We know that, right? So as long as we're focusing our attention on the seeds of scarcity, then scarcity grows and fills our lives. But if we choose to invest our attention and give our nurture to the seeds that grow peace and joy and feelings of enoughness and kindness and wisdom and all those good things, then we enjoy a bountiful harvest. We truly do. You know, for, and, and appreciation is what fertilizes the ground. We appreciate what's there. We let the new possibilities from acknowledging our inner resources take root. They begin to grow. We continue to give our appreciative attention, and there is this giant tree that grows up within us with deep and strong roots and infinite possibility. When we focus on that, it appreciates, right? Pretty soon we start to see flowers and fruit and wonderful things. So my invitation, my invitation to all of us is to commit together, to practice, yeah, gratitude, which we've talked about, it's very important, it is an emotional tone that changes everything, and appreciation. Look for what's within you. Look for the beauty and the strength and the wisdom and the kindness and the ability to make someone else's life. You can change it in a second just by a hello and a smile, right? All those things. Treasure those things. Love them. Appreciate them. Nurture them. And watch them grow. What we appreciate, appreciate. So my invitation is to appreciate yourself and all that you have and are. <laughs>